Jeremy Corbyn elected as leader of the Labour Party. Things can and they will change. I've got a question from Stephen, from Claire, from Gail. Vote to remain in the European Union. On a scale of one to ten, how passionate are you about saying in the EU? Seven, seven and a half. Article 50 has to be invoked now. I may not have put that as well as I should have done. The country will thank neither the branches in front of me nor those behind for indulging in internal factioning manoeuvring at this time. For heaven's sake, man, go! Jeremy Colburn elected as leader of the Labour Party. Labour will end the cuts in the National Health Service, will scrap tuition fees, will take our railways back into public ownership. The leadership has failed to address hatred against Jewish people within its ranks. I think we need a massive listening exercise. Good morning, how nice to see you, and goodbye. We're going out there to fight an election campaign. He couldn't lead the working class out of a paper bag. I will not lead the party in any future general election campaign. Good evening and welcome to Newsnight's Labour Leadership Debate. Jeremy Corbyn stood down after his party's worst results since 1935, its fourth general election defeat in a row. Now, the fight for the future, the very soul of the party is on. And whoever takes on the task of replacing Jeremy Corbyn will need superhuman qualities to lift Labour to where it needs to be. December's hammering left the party with just 202 MPs. It'll have to scoop more than half as many again if it's to win the next election. On a swing no party has achieved since the Second World War. These are the four candidates who believe they can do it. Tonight, in the first televised debate of the campaign, we'll test whether they're up to the job. The Shadow Business Secretary, Rebecca Long-Bailey, the candidate backed by the Jeremy Corbyn Supporting Momentum Group. The Shadow Brexit Secretary, Keir Starmer, the front-runner right now, he was previously Director of Public Prosecutions. The Shadow Foreign Secretary, Emily Thornbury, who served under the last three Labour leaders and is the only candidate who is not yet through to the final ballot. And the MP for Wigan, Lisa Nandy, the only backbencher in this race. She previously served as Shadow Climate Change Secretary. And the next 45 minutes will be about what kind of Labour leader you might all be, or well, one of you will be, but we can't afford the elephant in the room. And I'm just going to start off with a show of hands. Raise your hands. That calamitous election defeat. Put your hand up if you saw it coming. Two of you did, Emily. So unwinnable, you thought, from that, at that point? I didn't think we should have an election. I thought that, actually, that's what Boris Johnson had wanted from the moment that he was elected leader of the Tories. He was trying to goad us into an election, and they had a caref carefully crafted way of doing it. They were going to do get Brexit done. They had three words. That's the general election they wanted, and I'm afraid they gave it... We gave it to them, and not only did we leave the European Union, you but we, we gave them lose. this. I'm afraid I warned about this. I wrote to Jeremy. I'd said that we shouldn't have a general election. People might find it pretty astounding that you two didn't. You didn't raise your hands. Rebecca Long-Bailey, did you not see it coming? How could you not see a defeat like that We coming? knew that the anger within our communities was palpable, particularly on the issue of Brexit. I'm in a leave seat in the so-called red wall and many of my constituents and friends were telling me how angry they were because they thought that Labour was undermining the result of the referendum quite frankly and those Remain voters thought we weren't going far enough to foster that close relationship with the EU. But I think the, wor but we didn't... the worst thing that was going to happen was a hung parliament. I mean how That's could you think right. that? I mean we knew, we knew that there was something happening but the devastating result that, that came in that exit poll on that evening I don't think I was expecting. It was absolutely devastating and we've got to recognise that now we have to listen to our voters if we're going to win again. And Keir Starmer, were you not listening before the election? Did you not realise it was going to happen this way? Well, we knew we were up against it when we started. Of course we did. Um, and we knuckled down and got on with it. So was it about a bad election campaign? No, no, in the hope that we could repeat what had happened in 2017. But I don't, I don't think any of the candidates would say they anticipated the scale of what happened uh, that night, even those that thought we were going to lose, I don't think genuinely thought it was going to be by that much. Um, that came as a shock, I think, to all of us when we saw that exit poll. I mean, Lisa Nandy, you put up your hand. Did you think it was going to be that bad? We felt the ground shaking beneath our feet in coalfield seats like mine for decades. 2010, 2015, 2017 and then 2019, the entire base collapsed beneath our feet. We should have heard this coming. It's a sign of how deeply disconnected we became at the top of this party that we didn't. And if we're honest, we still don't understand. 
understand what has happened. We are not going to win back Bassett Law by deselecting MPs or having conversations grandstanding about military action. Can you the give challenges me a key that we face for the, for are the so defeat. Are you big. referring to Keir Starmer? I'm, I'm referring to this contest. The challenges that we face are so big, and yet our debate has become so very small. We've got to go out there and listen to what people have been telling us for decades. They think we have far too little understanding of the problems that people face, very little to say about the solutions, and they don't trust us to deliver on them, and they haven't for a very long time. I mean, Keir Starmer, you have made a pledge this election, no more illegal wars. What do you mean by that? Do you mean Iraq was, was an illegal war? I thought Iraq was an illegal war. I said that at the time, but... Does that make Tony Blair a war criminal? No, it doesn't. That's a completely different matter. Uh, but what I set out was a military action is obviously a very, very serious thing to do. I don't think we should have done it in 2003. I don't think you could never take military action, of course. But what I was saying is there should be really three tests. Is it lawful under international law? That's a, obviously a first and important issue. Is it going to achieve its aim because we're deploying troops? And then thirdly, unless it's an emergency, there must be the consent of Parliament, which has almost become a convention now. And I'd like to see that wrapped up in legislation so we've got real clarity. What's the consequence of it being an illegal war, though? Well, if it's an illegal war, then under international <coughs> law, it shouldn't have happened. It doesn't mean it's criminally illegal. I won't bore you with all the details of that, but criminal international law is, is slightly different. What the should happen to Tony Blair as a result, then? Well, the legality is this. It's either got to be in self-defence or you've got to have a UN Security Council resolution. They're the two pillars of legality. I don't believe we had that in 2003. But what I don't want to do in this competition is look backwards. We have got to look forwards here. We've just had not one election defeat, but four. Uh, and what really matters now is can we pick ourselves up and get ourselves in a position where we can win in the future? So just we quick, can argue we about do the that, war. Would you like to see Tony Blair in The Hague? No, I don't think that's what it's about. Uh, you know, again, you're tempting me to Rebecca, look back... Rebecca, would you like so... to see Tony Blair in The Hague? <laughs> well, look, I think we can all recognise within the Labour Party and our community certainly feel this, that we made the wrong decision in terms of going to war with the back. And we can't repeat those mistakes again. And that's why it's right to, to have a foreign policy that puts security of our people right at the forefront, and that's the role of any Prime Minister and any Labour leader. But it, that policy has to be predicated on international human rights, justice, the rule of law, and in the case of Iraq, it was very clearly not a legitimate decision to take. And let's move on to other mistakes. Can a key reason for the I, I, key reason for the defeat, Emily. Can I just talk about? Uh, can I just talk about this, this issue of foreign policy because it's it's kind of my thing. Um, I think that I think what we need to do is learn the les lessons of Chilcot. We waited for so many years for the Chilcot review to come out after the Iraq War, and what Chilcot said was that we should not be involved in interventions, military interventions in other countries if we don't have the support of the international community, if we, we're not defending ourselves, but also if we don't have a plan. Because, you know, we have, we've had people talking about, let's, let's cut the head off the snake. Well, what happens when you cut the head off a snake? You just get a dead snake. You know, that's not the way to go about it. And I remember challenging the Tories about this when Chilcot came out and said, have you learnt the lessons of Chilcot? And the Prime Minister was saying, oh, we don't need to worry about that. We do, we've already learnt the lessons. Okay. If we had have lost the lessons... the lessons of the last if election? We, let's if we, get back to if the we had Let me just finish the sentence. If we had learnt the lessons of Iraq, we would not have intervened in Libya. And we would not have left Libya in the chaos that it was left in. Have you left the la have you learned the lessons of the last election? You're shaking your head, Lisa Nandy. What do you mean? Well, I don't think we have, because one of the things that we did in the last election was we made promises that we simply couldn't keep. And the lesson from the last election and from the ones before that is that people are smarter than we think. We cannot carry on going around as a party making promises to nationalise everything, to slash to which or get rid of tuition fees we haven't got a clue how we would do it and how we would pay for it. People are smarter than that. We have to be honest with them. The problems we have as a country are very, very complex. The solutions are hard and they require hard choices. Now, we have to be ambitious for this country, but that means we have to be honest about the scale of those problems and we've got to involve people in the solutions themselves. What about Jeremy Corbyn? Was he a liability or an asset for you in this general election? Keir? Well... I mean, firstly, we've just spent a bit of time on the Iraq war, which didn't come up once, as far as I know, in any of the doors that I knocked on. So that, 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 that's history. We so all what did positions come up? On that. What's the key reason you think? A, a number of things came up. Um, the leadership of the Labour Party came up. Uh, our position on Brexit came up in different places, in different ways. 
uh, what people saw as the overload of the manifesto came up. They liked some of what was in the manifesto. They thought it was overloaded. And I'm afraid anti-Semitism came up. So we've got to address each and every one of those. But we've also... Let's not make the mistake of saying there was just one thing, it was all fine, but for this one thing, change that one thing, it'll all be fine. We've actually lost four. Uh, and whatever the readout on Jeremy Corbyn, Jeremy Corbyn cannot be the cause of the loss of the last four uh, elections. So we've got to go a bit deeper than this, because if we don't, we're not going to do what we need to do in order to get from here back into a position where we can win an election. Keir Starmer mentioned anti-Semitism. Tomorrow, all of you will have a hustings in front of the Jewish Labour movement. Rebecca Longbelli, are you going to apologise to them for anti-Semitism? We can never stop apologising for not tackling this issue robustly in the way that we should have done. And that's why I hope that all all leadership candidates will take forward a robust programme of action very swiftly. And that includes adopting any recommendations made by the EHRC. It means developing an independent process to deal with anti-Semitism and wider discriminatory issues within the party, because we are an anti-racist party and we have to have the gold standard and we have to recognise that over the last few years we have not tackled this issue adequately. But on the issue of of why we lost the general election, there were many issues and many of the candidates have spoken about them. Brexit was one. We weren't trusted by our constituents on Brexit and sadly... and I I understand the man sitting next to you was the architect of that policy. Do you blame him? Actually, the policy was agreed by the Shadow Cabinet and by all of our members at conference. So, I I mean, that's often said, but uh, Becky knows that full well because she agreed at the same time as me. I understand why Keir took the action that he did within Parliament to try and avoid a damaging no-deal Brexit, but sometimes within our communities it seemed as if we were playing parliamentary games, but our message didn't get out there and it resulted in the catastrophe that we saw on election night. But our trust issues go way beyond Brexit, unfortunately. Anti-Semitism was one issue that you've mentioned. But division was another. We had four years of division within our party, of colleagues briefing against colleagues, undermining the elected leader of our party. And divided parties don't win elections. And then on the final point, again, this has been mentioned, we had some of the most transformative policies in our manifesto. The Green Industrial Revolution, public ownership of our utilities, reworking our economy so it worked for people. But we didn't have a message that spoke to our communities. And we didn't talk about raising their aspirations. We need to move on, bring Emily into this. Emily, there's been talk about anti-Semitism earlier. I just wanted to ask you about that tomorrow this hustings will you be happy to apologize i've apologized so often i mean i'm doing again yeah i mean you know we may be throwing anti-semites out of our party now and i'm really pleased to see that we are but why didn't we do it two and a half years ago we really should have done this and i think it completely undermined who we were as a party and the idea that there is a group in britain who rightly or wrongly i think wrongly but some of them genuinely felt that they would be less safe if there was a Labour government elected, is something that shames all of us. And two of those standing for deputy leadership haven't signed up yet to the Board of Deputies' pledges on how to tackle anti-Semitism within Labour. Rebecca long would you give them a role in your shadow cabinet if they continue to keep that position? Well, as leader, I will be signing up to the ten pledges. You haven't signed it yet. I would expect my shadow cabinet and all those within it and our members and MPs within Parliament to follow me and follow my lead on that. I think we need to take that robust action quickly. We're so not, you'd insist, I, would you? We are not a racist party. We are an anti-racist party, but we lost the trust of the Jewish community. Would everyone agree? Would you insist on your deputies signing that pledge? If you're anti-Semitic, you shouldn't be in the Labour Party. And if you're not prepared to fight anti-Semitism, you shouldn't be in a shadow cabinet, I think, of any of us. Um, What this requires is real leadership going forward. Many people are saying, stop squabbling about uh, the past. Tell us what you're actually going to do about it. And this takes leadership. Um, I've led an organisation, um, a national organisation. I know that if if you're going to change something in an organisation, you have to lead from the top. And and you have to say, I need a line of sight on this. Uh, And I would say, I want to see these cases. I want to see what's happening every week on my desk, if necessary. But also, I will rebuild that relationship um, with the Jewish community. Uh, um, And a test for our party will be whether those that have left because of anti-Semitism feel safe to return to our party. Um, but this Lisa, requires to be said by the Would you be insisting on your deputies signing that pledge? Well, I would, but can I say this, that I don't think we're quite having a reckoning here with how badly we've got this wrong as a party. I spoke out about anti-Semitism the only time I broke collective responsibility when I was in the Shadow Cabinet, because not to do so would have made me complicit. 
And I've stood up over and over again, especially when it's hard. As the chair of Labour Friends of Palestine and the Middle East, I was at our rallies, at conference, telling people that nobody should be in the Labour Party who doesn't defend the right of Israel to exist. And I have to say this, is that it's not good enough now to say that we're sorry. We should have been doing something about this Do for a very long time. Do you think your colleagues haven't played their part, then? Do you I think other candidates haven't played their part? I don't believe that we have shown part? the leadership that is required. I have friends, well, Jewish Emily, what do you female think about MPs, that? who were hounded out of the Labour Party because they couldn't find people to stand up and speak out. I Emily, tried to do, do something about, about it Did behind the scenes, stand up? but Did when I stand couldn't, up? I spoke out. And that is the party I believe in, and that is the leadership I will show. Emily? I think that it was really important, as I often said, that it is our duty to speak out against the far-right government of Netanyahu and what it is that that government is doing to the two-state solution. But Which is that different is not, from being anti-Semitic. Hang on, exactly. And then to explain to people, you do that, and that is not anti-Semitic, but you do not blame the Jews for that. And, and to explain to people, there is a clear disconnect. It is not the fault of some guy who lives in a flat in North London. He is not responsible for the death of Palestinian children. And people really need to understand the difference. And time and time again, in my role okay. as Shadow Foreign Secretary, I made that absolutely clear. And, and I think that it would be right to say that the record shows that I have regularly called out anti-Semitism in my party I think we're going to have to move in a to the very future. public way. I, I just want to respond to, to what Lisa said, because um, I think this is the uh, studio where Andrew Marr is recorded. I've sat here and made the points about anti-Semitism in our party. So the idea that we haven't spoken out is not actually accurate, so we just need to correct the record there. I think and also there is... it ought to be said that Kira and I were both in the Shadow Cabinet and would regularly, the yeah. two of us, call okay. for regular reports to the Shadow Cabinet... Are you saying Becky find didn't? Out Rebecca was... didn't? No, I don't think Rebecca did, but, but Kira and I did uh, regularly. Rebecca did. <laughs> I think you'll find. Sorry, I don't remember. Look, look, let's not descend into scoring <clears throat> yeah, points. Yeah. The question is, what are we going to do to address it, to restore faith in let's the Jewish Let's start with an honest reckoning about how badly we've collectively got this wrong, and then let's put a plan in place to get it right. OK. That's what I published this okay. week. OK. And we, what we are going to look to the future. We're going to explore a little more about the type of policies that you would offer the British people if you became leader. But first, our policy editor, Lewis Goodall, has this reminder of the different approaches in the party's recent history when it comes to the economy, with some views of traditional Labour voters living in Bassett Law, a constituency that turned blue at the election. Have they done it? by borrowing and borrowing and borrowing. Forget Brexit and the rest. The real argument Labour has essentially been having for 45 years is how to respond to this. It's the Labour government that has brought us record peacetime taxation. They've got the usual socialist disease. They've run out of other people's money. How to respond to a world where corporations and global free markets, not states, appear most sovereign. Let's go this way, sir. Tony Blair's response was to embrace it, to hold the city close, to defend it and then, very quietly, redistribute the spoils. But the crash put pay to that. New Labour's model of social democracy disappearing. This is it. This is a copy of the letter that they left. Never let them forget it. Dear Chief Secretary, I'm afraid there is no money. Ed Miliband began a journey to a different vision of political economy. Are you on the side of the wealth creators or the asset strippers? The producers or the predators? But that vision was completed in earnest by Jeremy Corbyn. One of the central questions for the party now is whether it was its left-wing economic programme or Brexit, which was its undoing. I don't trust them with countries' money, though because they, they just waste it. They'll get it all away and then we've got to pay for it to end at day. But Labour has to respond too, to a Tory party singing some of its interventionist tunes. You've got old Boris Johnson there. He's promising the world. He's promising the world. My family were all minors, so it just makes sense to vote Labour. The Labour Party is not actually a Labour Party now. It was for the working class and they're not now. And I would like to get a sense of kind of the kind of leader you'd be, where you'd position the party. Let's go for another quick fire show of hands round. I'm asking you to raise your hands. When you go into the next election, would you have any of these in your manifesto, potentially? First of all, raise your hands if you're into scrapping tuition fees. That's everyone. Renationalising water and electricity. Yeah. Abolishing private schools. Nobody. 
keeping the pension age at 66. Oh, nobody. And a four-day week. No. OK, so you're sticking with some of John McDonald's spending plans. It sounds still like quite a lot of spending. Uh, one of the interviewees in, in Lewis Goodall's piece there said they didn't trust you with the country's money. Where's the money going to come from? Keir Stummer, I think you have already pledged, talked about raising taxes on the top 5%. How much would you raise it by? I've said that we should raise tax uh, for those that have more, um, that corporation tax should change, and fundamentally, tax avoidance has to be tackled. I mean, Amazon, I think, had revenue of 10.9 billion uh, in this country last year and paid 2% tax. And how now, should the top rate of income tax so, be I, 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 Actually, not many people quarrel with those principles, but we're one of the wealthiest countries uh, in the world, and yet the economy simply isn't working for people. So people earning more than £80,000 should pay more tax? How much? Well, look, we have a position where children who need mental health assessments are waiting 18 months, eight-year-olds. Nobody can think that's right. We've got homelessness going through the roof and we've got life expectancy going down in some areas and huge gaps. So how much money are you going to take Pe off these people to People pay for want it? something done about this. And when, when I, went, I went to, I think, 44 constituencies in this general election, people said, we want things to change. I accept they didn't trust how? us to change how? it. But, but this idea that people want change, we've got to do fundamental things, but you don't have to pay for it, is just a myth. We've got to set out Tell our Tell us story. how much, then. How much would you charge well, those higher income taxes? This is a question for the next general election, but I've indicated broadly I'm comfortable, I think it's right, that those that can afford to pay more do pay more. I think it's right that corporations pay their fair share, and I really think people shouldn't be avoiding tax and on Lisa... the scale they are. Now, actually, I don't think that's controversial. I, so I think most people Lisa say, Nally... actually, if you're going to produce a better country for that, I'm up for it. Lisa Nandy, the last... Labour government that got elected yep. pledged not to raise income tax yep. and it won an election. I think in the evening standard you said we've got to be more, you know, honest about public services yep. and how you fund it and that actually there may have to be tax rises across the board. Is that what you said? Yeah, I think that's right. We've got to win the argument on tax. Tax is not a bad thing. It's the mark of how we contribute to a civilised society that cares for its people. But to do that, tax has to be fair. So we all stood on a manifesto this time round in which we said we would raise the top rate of income tax by 5%, and I expect we probably all still support that. But if we just look at income, that's not where the wealth is. The wealth is in assets. So we need to start taxing assets and, at a, a minimum, bring wealth, a taxes, tax? bring, bring wealth taxes into line with income tax. Including a mansion tax? It, 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 areas like mansion tax, land value tax, these are all things that the next Labour government should do. But we've got, to do, some, we've got to do something a million much more... Pounds, half a million got, pounds. But we've got to do something much more ambitious than just bringing wealth taxes in line with income taxes. We've also got to look at the hidden charge for being poor in this country. There are hidden poverty taxes. It costs more to borrow money. It costs more for your energy bills. Costs more to insure your home or your car in poorer areas, even costs more to get money out of ATMs. And Labour has to tackle those hidden poverty taxes if we're going to win the argument that tax is a good thing. Emily Thornbury, do you think is there a place for aspiration and wealth creation in the Labour Party? Of course there is. We are the party of the safety net. We're the party that thinks that, and we are a country, frankly, of a safety net. I think that the British way is that if people are down on the luck, we look after one another. And that is the way that we are. And we have slid so far to the right that that safety net has holes in it that is so big that entire families fall through and end up in food banks, that people end up sleeping on the streets. And people are disgusted. But why couldn't you get that it. message across at the last election? Well, <laughs> because it was a Brexit election. But let me say this that what was in our manifesto was that for those who are earning over 100,000, the top rate of tax was 50 pence. You know, and frankly, it's about the same level that it was last time Labour was in government. And I'm completely comfortable with that. I think that we need to go back to that, just like we need to go back to being a country where we do not allow there to be these great big holes. We don't have people bleeding to death in A&E, waiting in corridors to be seen, children sleeping on piles of coats who might have breathing difficulties. This is not the way our country behaves. Rebecca. And frankly, we as the Labour Party are the way to are the party to sort that out, and we need to make um, sure that we put those arguments Rebecca. clearly in front of people so that we can regain their trust. Because I Rebecca. think people don't want to. I must to be bring like Rebecca this. in now. Right. Rebecca, you are all sounding pretty similar in terms of you know spending plans. One of your MPs today was streeting, said if the definition of insanity is doing the same thing twice, expecting a different result. 
What do we call a third time? A death wish. Do you have a death wish? Look, tax pays for our public services and our public services deliver our future. They help us realise our aspirations, whether that's good health, good education, good infrastructure that leads to improvements in productivity. And we should never be afraid of making the case for a fair taxation system. We've seen what happened when the government slashed taxes uh, for, for the most wealthy in society. They slashed corporation tax. We so didn't you'd see... you put them up? We didn't see... Well, up? I'm quite happy with the 45p tax rate for those earning over 80,000 and the 50p tax rate for over 125,000. So I think the question we should be asking candidates now is do we support those two proposals going into a general election. If there was a snap general election, say, in six months' time, I'm happy to support those. I don't think we should be ambiguous with our members. Lisa and Andy, if you talk about the economy, it looks like the Conservatives have veered left on the economy. Mm -hmm. you know, Boris Johnson, he's ridden his wagons into your heartlands. He's, uh, you know, making all sorts of promises, whether it's on buses, the Jeremy Corbyn's favourite, or, you know, massive spending, potentially, as a part of this budget. He's even talking about a mansion tax, potentially. It's being raised. He's stolen your clothes. I wonder what you'd steal of his to make yourself electable. Well, I, I wouldn't steal anything of his, because I think that he fundamentally underestimates the level of ambition in the communities that he now, he and his MPs now represent. Look, let me say something really controversial. I am glad that Boris Johnson has pledged £5 billion for our buses. I have been desperate for someone to do something about our buses for a very long time. And while we have obsessed about trains in Westminster, most people out in the country are on buses and they can't wait for a better bus service. I just wish it had been Labour that had promised to do that. But there is a problem with so what Boris Johnson job, is he? doing. Do you think he's, he's, doing a good he's job? investing, but he's, inve he's making those investment decisions yet again from Whitehall, a small group of men sitting behind a desk hundreds of miles away from the reality of people's lives. I believe Labour can be more ambitious than that. Our communities know better than anyone what investment they need and how that money should be spent. And the next Labour government that I lead will give people the power to make those decisions for them. Yeah, he's doing it? a good job, isn't he? Look, Boris Johnson promises all sorts of things and doesn't deliver them. Only weeks ago he was saying, uh, after Brexit there'll be no tariffs, no checks, none of that, and now he's chucking that all overboard by the day. So we know what Boris Johnson is. He's a man who barely knows truth from untruth um, and puts promises out there and doesn't follow through on them. And, and the job of the next leader of the Labour Party, amongst others, is to be a very effective opposition against him because he does not like to be held to account. And we've Rebecca, got to hold him to account. would you steal anything of his? I think uh, Boris Johnson talks the talk, but he's not going to walk the walk. We are the most regionally unequal country in the whole of Western Europe. And what we need is an aspirational, transformative plan that invests in our regions and nations alongside a real and robust, comprehensive industrial strategy. The government's industrial strategy, well, they've not talked about it at all since Boris Johnson came into power, let alone provide the investment required to re-industrialise many of our regions and nations, particularly in our high Lands. Emily, it must be galling, though. He seems to be stealing Labour's clothes and voters are voting for him. Yeah, but he does... You know, what's important is not what politicians say, it is what they do. And the job of an opposition is he to... He seems to be doing it. To, wait a minute, is to hold him to account. So, for example, on the £5 billion for buses, who's going to be making the decisions about the exactly. bus routes? There's nothing in that announcement about ownership. What's he going to do? So we need to be hold... So it's great, £5 billion, that sounds great. But what does it mean? Where are you going to be putting the money? Who's going to be making the decisions? And who do you, when you close your eyes, who are you actually thinking about? That's what we need to be doing. We need to be holding him to account on that. What he does is what's important. And at the moment, I, I fully understand, he's off making all these promises. But as time goes on and people realise that it is all hot air... We need to be there to expose it. Thank you. This, of course, isn't hot air, but there are so many questions facing Britain after Brexit. With the old rules being ripped up, it may be a chance to assess Britain's identity in the 21st century, to reimagine, perhaps, the kind of country we want to be and who gets to be part of it. In amongst that, some call it identity politics, others a culture war. There are questions dominating our politics which politicians can seem ill-equipped to deal with. First, with some more views from the Red Wall, Here's Lewis Goodall with a look at how Labour has wrestled with the issue of immigration in the past. Six months, six you can't months. say anything about the immigrants because we're saying that you're... you're, you're, you're but all these Eastern Europeans want to come in. Where uh, are they fucking well, from? Million people. It used to be so simple. Left and right, rich and poor. Yeah. Then came along new, more complicated divides. 
Good to see you all. Good to see you. Thanks very much. It's a disaster. Well, just... She'd never have put me with that, that woman. Oh, everything. She's just a sort of bigoted woman. A period where Labour's old coalition dissolved, where politics orbited cultural questions, and Labour, like centre-left parties across the West, struggled to digest them, especially on immigration. Well, I think Labour would let everybody in, wouldn't they? Whether there's any restrictions or not. Labour used not to be so conflicted. It was once much more authoritarian. It was Jim Callaghan, as Home Secretary, who imposed strict controls on Commonwealth migrants. But both Blair and Corbyn, in their own ways, changed that. The former opening labour markets, the EU East, the latter synonymous with liberalism around the migration question. Our economy and our society has been enriched massively by people that have made their homes here. Today, the next Labour leader must somehow retain its new liberal base whilst reconnecting with those it has lost in these new cultural battles. I'm not even sure on their policy about it all. I think they're just free movement with it. I think that people should be working and contributing to the, to the UK. We're not a nation, a country now that can afford to have hangers on. We've all got to work for this country to keep it to what we've got now. I don't think they'll ever get in again in this country. Well, they'd have to prove themselves a lot before then, like, let's put it like that. Well, let's start with you, Rebecca. I mean, since 2000, do you think immigration levels have been too high, too low, or just about right? I think the Oxford Migration Observatory, the group that's linked to Oxford University, have shown that there's not been a, a great impact on our economy or certainly depression of wages by the number of people that are coming in from overseas. I'm the daughter of migrants. We worked hard. My parents are proud of living in this country. And I think we need to make the case for how positive immigration can be in the wake and in the face of a government who has created a hostile environment for many people who have come here to make their life here and contribute very positively to our economy. Henry Thornbury, does that sound right to you? Yeah, I think that we've benefited hugely from immigration. We are a country of immigrants and we need to have an immigration system that benefits our economy and our community and public services. Are you happy that I immigration to... levels are about right? Well, I think that right? so long as it's, it serves our communities and our, and our public services and our economy, then that's, that's the level that we not should so? have. Well, I think that that's what's important is that, you know, we can see that our country in terms of our economy is a net beneficiary of, of migration. Um, and you just need to see some industries. I mean, when my dad had, had dementia, he was in an old people's home and he, he, he used to work in the United Nations and all the people working in his care home spoke different languages and he thought that he was back in the UN. I mean, you, without these, without migration, many of our services will fall over. But Lisa Nandy... Polling evidence from YouGov, for example, shows that people 60% of UK adults support reductions in immigration. Yeah, but I think this debate is a bit daft, really, because we've seen Tory governments over and over again over the last 10 years that have set targets to reduce immigration and then have done nothing of the sort, because, as Emily rightly says, we're, we're a net beneficiary from immigration. I think you can win the argument on this, and I think we have to win the argument, because people know when politicians aren't being honest, and we believe in immigration. We are not a party that wants to put immigration slogans on mugs. My dad came to this country country from India in the 50s, made an enormous contribution. I'm proud of the contribution immigrants make. But the way we win the argument is to make sure this is fair. When my constituents said that free movement wasn't fair, they didn't mean they didn't want nurses coming here to work in our hospitals and care for our people. What they meant was, you've abolished the nursing bursary and now I can't get a job in that hospital myself. Kim. Free movement is a good thing, but it has to be coupled with investment in our young people. Kim but, Stammer, I think back four years ago, you said to Andrew Marr in this studio, probably, you, you thought immigration should be reduced. Let, let, let's put this um, in context and have our dividing lines. Boris Johnson wants a hostile environment. Uh, as leader of the Labour Party, I would want a welcoming environment. And now let's talk about human beings. My family and I have just been through 17 days of intensive care in St Mary's Hospital. Um, I've seen my wife's mother cared for by people from all nationalities. At the bed, two beds down from her, um, there's a patient that's been there for a bit longer. She has had 44 uh, nationalities um, caring for her. I just wonder what those nurses would think of this debate. Um, and and we, need, we need to, therefore, get away from the numbers and the rhetoric. 
and be honest about the contribution that people who've come to this country have made. Rebecca, uh, Lisa and Andy mentioned freedom of movement. Um, do you think... I think the other three candidates think they'd still fight for that. Do you think that ship has sailed? My own personal position is that I'm in favour of freedom of movement, but I think the reality will be very different. We're not in government and we have to fight as an opposition to make sure that the new immigration system that the Conservatives bring in is fair and it's not based on targets but based on values that ends the hostile environment, that protects the rights of EU citizens who live here and UK citizens abroad, that ends the no recourse to public funds uh, mantra that the government sells consistently and ensures that our refugees and asylum seekers are welcome here and that we meet our international obligations in this regard. Emily, when it comes to freedom of movement, you know, Boris Johnson's position is it ends at the end of this year. Are you saying that you would want it renegotiated? I'm saying that it's really important that we negotiate a proper trade deal with the European Union since half our trade is with the European Union. And Boris Johnson says that he can get the whole deal done in a year and, and end freedom of movement. And what does that look like? Continue is it to look after Union, single market well, so, so as well? So, what we have to do is we have to negotiate something serious with the European Union. Boris Johnson spent the last month working out whether or not Big Ben should bong or not, or whether we should have 50 pence coins celebrating Brexit. He's not actually doing a serious negotiation with the European Union. And part of that has to be how do we get access to the European Union's market? And part of that has to also be a discussion discussion about migration. So we need to be able to be open-minded and have a negotiation properly because in the end we're talking about people's jobs and the economy and frankly that should be at the forefront of Boris Johnson's mind and not whether or not we get a new 50 pence coin. And Keir Summer, when you talk about freedom of movement, are you seriously suggesting that you want to renegotiate going back into the structures of the EU, that if you were Labour leader you'd be wanting us back into a customs union? Katie, all my, all my life I've been able to go and work in Europe um, or to live in Europe, um, or to study in Europe. And I want the next generation to have those opportunities. I want people here to be able to work in Europe, and I want people in Europe to be able to work here. I want people here to be able so to study in Europe. So you want to join the EU? But just hear me through. I want, I want people here to be able to study in Europe, and people in Europe to come and study here. They contribute hugely. And, and I want families to be able to live together. We, we talk but about exactly freedom of movement as if it's a set EU. of technical rules. It's you about be how part human of the beings customs union. behave. If you're in favour of freedom of movement, surely you're therefore negotiating to be back in, single market, customs union? No, it, we've got to have an arrangement with the EU about what we want to happen next. However it comes about, I want people to be able to work across Europe and I want people in Europe to be able to work here. I want people to be able to join their families both ways and I really want people to be able to study in Europe and study here. So are it's you ruling out benefit. rejoining the well, customs uh, union? It's not about really the customs union or anything else. It's Single about market. What is it that you want to get out of the negotiations? I want a society, I want, I want the next generation to have the same opportunities as I've had and I don't want to kick that away uh, for, for, for them. EU? Ruling out rejoining the EU at some point? I don't think there's any question really of rejoining the EU. We, we, we've just left the EU. The Leave Remain debate is over and the divide is over and we need to let it go, all of us, whichever way we uh, uh, voted on this. Well, I, I think Keir's right that that debate is over. We're not in power, we can't rejoin the EU. But what we can do is learn the lessons of the last few years. We, there is no substitute for winning the argument and our future lies with Europe outside of the EU, but very close cooperation on climate change, on the refugee crisis, on national security, on jobs and manufacturing and wages and terms and conditions and environmental standards. And we've got to go out to the country now and win that argument and hold the government to account for it. You've all been warning about the pressures on the union that Brexit could deliver. Rebecca, I mean, during the recent Irish election, for example, the Sinn Féin president, Mary Lee MacDonald, she said she wants a border poll on a united Ireland. I mean, how relaxed are you about that? Well, the Good Friday Agreement provides for the people of Northern Ireland to determine what they want to happen with that. So it's not our role as, a, as an opposition or as a, as a government when we're in well, power to interfere, with, to, to interfere with that. Um, but what I would say is that there's a wider issue, and this extends into Wales, into Scotland, and indeed into many of our regions. We talk about the Brexit debate and how angry our communities were about feeling detached from power that was held in Brussels, people making decisions about their lives and they had no control. Control. But the fact is, is that most people don't feel any different about Westminster. We see the rise of the SNP in Scotland. We see that there's a drive for another independence referendum and you have to question why. And I think that it's down to the powers that we have devolved to many areas. They okay, don't have sufficient power, but about Ireland, what's happened in Ireland. I mean, were you happy to see the Sinn Féin victory? 
I think, well, we haven't seen what's happened yet. I understand that discussions are ongoing in terms of forming a government there. So we'll have to wait and see what happens normally, over the they? coming days. They may be involved in the government. She may even be the T-shirt. Well, it's going to be an interesting few days, I think. You're listening to the people. You talk about listening to the people, Lisa and Andy. If the people of Northern Ireland want, in the future, a united Ireland, would you back it? Well, the Good Friday Agreement is really clear that that's a decision for the Secretary of State to make, not for Sinn Féin um, alone. And the reason for that is that the Good Friday Agreement is very, very carefully calibrated because of the very complex history in Northern Ireland to make sure that we maintain peace. I will never do anything that interferes with that. But well, I The Sinn Féin President is saying potentially that might be part of negotiations. She wants the EU... You know, Ireland have a veto, and she wants the EU to put this on the table as part of the negotiation. Well, there's Would no, you accept that? No question at all that the hard Brexit that Boris Johnson has pursued and the idiocy of the way that he and that small gang of Tories led by Jacob Rees-Mogg have handled the issue about Britain outside of the European Union has made this much, much harder and has made it much more challenging by placing an internal border within the United Kingdom. I fought against that. I tried to prevent it. I wish we'd been able to do so. But the question now is how we protect the Good Friday Agreement. The UK is a co-guarantor to that. We all have responsibilities for it. And we've got to make sure that we defend and uphold those principles and the right of the Secretary of State to make that decision. Keir Starmer, there are a number of issues facing the union. If we just look at Scotland, if the SNP win big at the Holyrood elections next year, you've already said in an interview with ITV last month, they will have a mandate for an independence referendum. Could, could I just briefly mention Ireland, because I had the privilege of working there for five years um, on some of the Good Friday Agreement um, proposals for the police. And I know just how important it is to have the trust of both communities mm. as we go forward. And that's what the Good Friday Agreement seeks to achieve. It's why it's got a, a very careful mechanism to resolve these issues. And so and what should, about the we SNP? We should stick with that. So far as the SNP is concerned, I don't actually think they've got a mandate for anything if they win the next general election. I think we need... You said to... they'd have a mandate for an independence. What I them. was saying in Scotland is we need to get away from this stale debate between the status quo, which isn't working, and independence. Independence pulls countries apart, puts up borders, when I don't think they should be You were in there. favour of a second referendum on Brexit. What about but, a second but referendum But they, they put up borders. I, I think we should be making the case for radical devolution and further um, powers going to Scotland in a federal way. That's and, the argument I was making when I was up in Scotland. It actually goes to a wider point that Lisa made earlier um, about the, the sense of power and influence being closer to people. That should be in and Scotland Emily, and in Wales and, and across England as well. Emily, your views on the SNP and whether they'd have a mandate for a second referendum? Well, I think at the moment they're trying to bounce us into another referendum this year when everything is so chaotic and when everyone in Scotland, well, most people in Scotland are in a state of grief because we've got a Tory government in England and they're trying to... and, and, and they're leaving the European Union. Now, we don't know how far Boris Johnson is going to drive us away from the European Union, so we don't know how high the wall might have to be between England and Scotland if Scotland was to be independent and be part of the European Union. So the idea that we can, at the moment, have a referendum this year when things are still so unsettled is clearly reckless nonsense from the Scottish nationalists okay. and has to be resisted. I mean, there's yeah. so much that we could talk about, and yeah. I'm sorry to break All in, right, but there's so much to talk about. Um, there isn't much time. But one issue that has been rumbling in your party for the last 24 hours is over trans rights. And, Rebecca, I think you've signed a pledge that says the party will expel people who are transphobic. And can I just clarify what you mean? Is it transphobic to talk about biological sex? I think we need to protect the rights of trans people as we do any group within our party, and we are the party that does that. And it's not legitimate to put anybody's rights up for debate within our party and we need to take robust action. But in terms of trans rights specifically, there's been a long rumbling debate both within the party and outside of the party about what the right legal course of action to take in terms of defining a, a particular person's rights are. And I've been very so clear... Is it transphobic to talk I about think... biological sex? To talk about biological sex... So, well, it depends in what context you talk about biological sex, but to refer it in a, in a transphobic way, then, of course, it's transphobic. There are Labour members who might feel uncomfortable about saying that, for example, people can self-identify their gender. Would you expel them, having signed this pledge? I am a firm believer in self-identification and I'd like that brought into UK law because I think we need to if end the discussion. They leave the party? We need to end the discussion on this and we need to protect the rights of individuals within our party and any transphobic behaviour so or discriminatory behaviour of any, any form is not acceptable.
So should they be expelled? Well, it depends. It would be assessed on a case-by-case -case basis. I couldn't answer a hypothetical question. You'd have to see what an individual had said and in what context. And, Emily, this pledge, have you signed this pledge? Do you intend to sign no, this No, I pledge? haven't signed it. I've, I've looked at it and, and I was worried about a bit of it um, because it talks about hate. And I got into trouble recently <laughs> talking about hate, and I don't think it's the right thing to have in a political debate. So is Rebecca I wrong think... to sign it? Well, hang on. And so what I'm trying to say is, is that, is that there needs to be a discussion. I think that we need to have certain clear, clear statements, which is that I think that trans women are women and trans men are men. I think that we need to be able to have a discussion where people don't shout at one another and say that they hate each other. I mean, there are hate crimes, that's one thing, but to describe certain organisations as hate organisations, I have some problem with. And so I don't want... I, I want us to be able... I don't, I, don't want this, I don't want this leadership debate to be dominated by this issue, albeit important, but I also want us to be able to talk to one another. Lisa, have and, you signed this pledge? Have you signed this pledge? And do you think people who have a problem with self-ID should be expelled from your party? Yeah, I, I signed the pledge and I think we're in danger of overcomplicating this. I think people who willfully go out to hurt and offend other people have no place in the Labour Party. I yes, think that we need to use care and compassion in the language that we use to one another. And the reason Does that I include somebody who feels uncomfortable with people self id people, people are free to raise concerns and challenge. Unity in the Labour Party is not uniformity and we have to be able to have an open debate. But the reason I signed that pledge is because I have a young person in my constituency who is going through this process at the moment. She deserves nothing less than my full compassion, care and support. The waiting times are horrendous. The bullying and discrimination is awful. And she needs to hear from me loud and clear in this contest that I believe her, I understand her, I accept her and I will stand up for her. Okay, Stoma, how do you define a woman? Well, trans rights are human rights. And we're talking about a community that's faced vilification and abuse. And the Labour Party stands up for people who face vilification and abuse. Do they trump the, women's the, rights? Because the, 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 that's what some people argue. They well, worry the Gender about Recognition that. Act was, was a big step in the right direction, but we need to go further. And other countries have now gone further, and therefore uh, we can look at those examples. There are difficult questions about uh, how we um, resolve this, but treating it as a political football with camps taking lumps out of each other uh, just does everybody a disservice, and it doesn't help those that want to go further than the, the Gender Recognition Act. So, okay, well, so we, we, we do need to dial this down. This is a really I'm serious issue. I'm going to draw issue. this to a close. I'm sorry, but on women's rights, Keir, I will ask you this quickly. How do you feel about the fact that here you have the potential of electing the first ever female leader of the Labour Party and you might be stopping that happening? How do you feel well, about I don't, that? I don't think, and the panellists will tell me if I'm wrong about this, I don't think anyone's putting themselves forward because they're a man or because no. they're a women. Let's get a feminist women. elected. Uh, 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 and That's we're all sincerely and genuinely putting forward what we think is best for our party, for our movement and for our country. And I can tell you this, and I, I suspect I speak for all of us, none of us think that this is all about one individual. If I'm leader of the party, I will have a very strong team alongside me uh, and I suspect that's the view we would all take, yeah. uh, that this is about collective leadership. And, Emily, tonight is your opportunity to persuade Le Labour members why you should get through, because you're not yet on that ballot paper. We're going to give each of you 45 seconds to make your pitch to be leader. Emily, why don't you kick off? OK. So the Labour Party's got a hell of a fight in front of it and it's going to be a long fight, it's going to take five years and I think that what the Labour Party needs is to be led by somebody who is battle-hardened, who's a street fighter, who has energy and who has experience of taking it to the Tories because we're going to need to take it to the Tories every day for the next five years. And I have experience of taking on Boris Johnson. I did so for two years when he was Shadow Foreign Secretary. I've done Prime Minister's questions. But I am a campaigner to my marrow. I have, was born in the party, I will die in the Labour Party. But I think that we have to be a party of hope and we have to be a party of positivity. I think that actually Britain can be better than this. It doesn't have to be this way and that we can lead a country into a better future, but only if people believe in us and we need to be credible. Rebecca. Tell me why you would be the best Labour leader. Well, like all Labour members, I was devastated to lose the election. And not just because we lost, but I knew what the next four years would mean for constituencies like mine in Salford, in Red Wall seats. And we need to face up to the defeat, but we can't just talk about it. 
We have to listen to our voters. We have to tell a story about how the Labour Party is the party of realising people's aspirations. We have to shift power away from Westminster and into the hands of our communities. And through our green industrial revolution, we have to harness the biggest economic lever we've had in a generation. That should be our mission. That stays true to our values and that will be our path to power. Kia. I came into politics to change lives and you don't change lives in opposition. So we've got a huge task ahead of us to get from where we are now back into power. Uh, and we've got a choice. We're as the Labour Party. We can mope around with our head in our hands, taking lumps out of each other, arguing about whose fault it was. We're pretty good at that. And if we do that, we'll lose the next general election. Or we can pull together, recognise that we need to be united, we need to be an effective opposition, and that we're responsible for the next leg of the journey. It's up to us. If we pull together, we can take us from where we are now to where we need to be, and we can be part of history. And I think our party, our movement, and our country would be proud of that if we're able to do it. And that's why I'm standing to be leader of the Labour Party. I want to pick us up after four election losses. I want to put us back in a position where we Must can do what on. I came into politics for, which is to change lives. Lisa Nandy. This shattering election defeat was a long time coming. We change or we will die. The Labour Party that I will lead will be rooted in our communities again and will always tell the truth. No more facing both ways on the major issues of the day. No more making promises that we know we can't keep. Leadership is about choices and being honest, especially when it's hard. So we will stand up for a country that is proud of all its people, our refugees and our veterans, and we will never let them divide us. The country I will lead will be compassionate, it'll be tough, and it'll be fiercely ambitious for the future. And I want people watching this at home to know that I will go out with courage and conviction and I will bring Labour home to them. Thanks to you all very much for being part of this first television debate and good luck.